Allah. Maybe I'll just start with an intro because I'm the least interesting one here, so people can come for your own introductions. Uh, so my name is Arkan Akin. Um, I play several roles related to the panel today. So I'm the co-chair of the Western chapter of the Crypto Valley Association. I'm based in Geneva in Switzerland. And uh, I'm also one of the co-founders of Toronet. And I also been working alongside Ernest and Balaji uh, concerning the Agro financing project. And, uh, and Joanna, we've met and had several uh, exchanges via email also on this top topic of agro financing. So really happy to, to dig into this question today. Um, I will please ask you to present yourselves. You'll do it better than me. So maybe in the order of my ski screen, Ernest, would you like to go first? Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm excited to be on this platform to talk about ag finance and the innovative solution that you are bringing to it. Uh, my name is Ernest Ihedibo. I am private sector specialist on the Feed the Future Agricultural Extension and Advisory Services Activity, one of the Feed the Future interventions of the United States Agency for International Development. Um, I'm based in Abuja, Nigeria, working with uh, Vorian Koreli, Nigeria, and Toronet on this initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ernest. Uh, Joanna, would you like to go? Sure. Hi, I'm Joanna Yo. I'm the CEO and founder of Aruka, which is aiming to scale financing to small businesses and farmers in digitalized supply chains um, and with a focus on sustainable finance. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Alegi, it's your turn. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Akan. Thanks, Anest, and thanks, Joanna. Um, my name is Balaji. I'm one of the co-founders of Toronet. I'm a serial entrepreneur. That's what I do. But I'm an agri innovator. That's where my strengths lie. And I've been innovating in agriculture for 10 years now. And interesting, we have a shared history with Anest. The largest ever technology for agriculture program on the African continent called eWallet. We co-created it together many, many years ago with the current president of African Development Bank. That was a big success story for technology and agriculture. And it had everything, input supplier financing. In fact, the only thing missing was extension inside that program. And what we call AgriFi today is building upon that foundation to kind of make things work better for the farmer. You know, and now totally from a private sector perspective, not from government. So that's how I'll introduce myself. Thank you very much, everybody. Before we jump into the blockchain aspect and the DeFi aspect and how can these technologies help with agrofinancing, uh, maybe we start because everybody who's on this call might not be super familiar, familiar with the issue itself. So um, I think, Ernest, you're really a good person to ask this question to start with. What do you think are the challenges of agrofinancing, at least from your lengthy experience in the sector? And, and yeah, what, what are the main issues that, that remain to be solved today? Well, uh, those issues are um, profoundly uh, the, the things that everyone else um, can easily identify. We talk about the uh, sustainable development goals uh, that seek to achieve certain uh, human uh, index um, uh, accomplishments by 2030. Uh, the first two SDGs uh, have to do with eradication of poverty and hunger. And we know that for this to happen, there has to be substantial increase in investments in food systems, and the agricultural sector. And so what we find is a situation where the volume of financing that is going into agricultural production does not seem to match this expectation that by 2030, um, hunger and poverty will be eliminated. I give you an example of Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is essentially an agrarian country with agriculture continuously contributing 25% of the GDP. And yet that sector employs 42, uh, about 48 to 49 or even 50% of the total employment. 
that tells us something that uh, a sector that employs the greater majority of the people of the workforce contributes 25% of the GDP. Uh, while as a sector it is applauded, it also points to a basic inefficiency um, that that sector continues to grap uh, grapple with. Uh, because if resources are appropriately allocated, there's no way 50% of a population should be contributing 75% of the economic resources of a country. So there's something that is not right with agriculture uh, in terms of its punching its full weight in an economy like Nigeria. And of course, it, we see that picture across the globe in different forms. And one reason is that agriculture is not getting the kind of funding it requires. Again, we have a situation in Nigeria where, uh, like Bolaji ex, uh, mentioned, the issue of extension service. The situation in Nigeria is such that you have one agricultural extension agent servicing uh, about 10,000 smallholder farmers. And uh, when you compare this to FAO prescription of about 600 farmers to one extension agent, which is more like the global average, you find out that uh, we're trying to achieve the impossible here in terms of extension agent and farmer ratio. What is behind this um, situation? Inadequate funding. So you find inadequate funding at various levels, at public sector level in terms of government infrastructure, and private sector level in terms of um, commercial financing going directly to smallholder farmers. And that sector has been characterized in so many uh, unprintable uh, languages uh, as a black hole. In fact, in one instance, it is called a black hole where somebody goes in that you don't know what lies beneath the surface and you don't know your way out. And all of that traceable to this issue of organizing smallholder farmers in such a way that they have access to, to, to uh, capital that will enable them activate the uh, production asset that they have. And quite frankly, the production, the, the, the arable land available in the country are in the hands of smallholder farmers. And yet they don't have capital to mobilize this production, uh, productive asset so as to really um, produce efficiently and drive the economy since we say we have an agrarian economy. Hmm. So here you find a situation where um, extension becomes very, very important. And that is why the USAID chose to intervene from that space. How can we provide enough resources so as to guide farmers on most impactful practices and efficient technologies that can make them produce competitively. And when you get them to adjust their attitude and adopt these most impactful practices, how do you finance the inputs, the processes, the technologies that are needed to produce efficiently and competitively such that this largest employer of labor that has a custody of the largest production asset in terms of land can therefore contribute to economy and economic development in a way it should. So we, we find here a situation that um, emphasizes the need for greater access, access to finance, deployment of capital in a way that the smallholder farmers who are available there, who have access to land, can use available technologies that are everywhere and they can afford it so as to deploy it and produce effectively. And that is a challenge. Thank you. I'll weigh in on this a little further. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just jump yes. in a little bit to like supplement a little bit on at least from where we sit in Asia, and and I'm sure there's like there's some areas of overlap, and then I think um, so where we're starting is we're very focused on supply chains. Um, so partly because those are guys we can partner with who are um already establishing these like digital ecosystems. So I mean you know. What we're, our platform really aims to do is to connect capital to these borrowing needs. So exactly to your point, like there, there's a huge gap. And what we find are some of the key um, issues. Uh, so there's the general issue, um, first of all, like if it's pre-harvest financing, um, I think some of these are very legitimate issues. So one is there are concerns about risk around um, 
side selling. So like a farmer may have agreed with you to produce corn for you, but then, um, you know, short term, they have some cash need because someone needs to go to the clinic, some bill needs to be paid, someone gets into an accident. Um, and there isn't very much available to them in terms of short term credit. So sometimes there is a bit of that kind of risk. Um, and, and that's one challenge we, we see. Another challenge is just general um, harvest uncertainty. So there is crop failure. So without access to some level of insurance um, where that protects financiers from that kind of um, risk, uh, there's a little bit more of a worry because like they can manage that if it's a large uh, agricultural agricultural like production um that to monitor but then if they're monitoring across a lot of smallholders they need help with some kind of um like intermediary sort of structure um, or ecosystem to support them um the other thing we see uh then relatedly to that and and you know the the, the structure could be a little bit different in some of in, in Nigeria and some of the other markets in which you guys operate but um, a lot of times the farmers um in at least Indonesia and India, where where um, some of our starting partners are, um, a lot of them, even if they're not that far away from the city, um, they don't actually have any access to like banking records. They don't have um, formal credit history. Um, so I think a key issue, and one of the things we try to tackle a little bit, and I'm sure um, Taranet's going to be talking about this too, is um, can we help develop portable credit histories for farmers? Um, whether it's because they don't have a bank account or in another case, there's also something kind of interesting that we see where someone may have a bank account, but their relative has borrowed their bank account to do something else within the village. And then some things happen. So there's a lot of like strange little frictions that all together um, create a lot of difficulties for, for large scale lenders um, to lend without partnering with some kind of in intermediary structure. And, and so that's what we aim to do um, and provide. And, and what we're finding is that not only do we need um, like an intermediary layer towards capital markets, but we ourselves need to work with um, ecosystems that can help pool risk um, so that you're not dealing with like one-off smallholder risk, but like a financier can feel like, can have, ways to uh, sort of manage their risk by creating a portfolio. So even if they're exposed to certain types of, you know, crop failure in certain places, here and there are someone side sells, um, on an aggregate basis, there are still ways to manage that. And there's also ways to find um, insurance to protect against things like um, crop failure. So uh, those are a few other uh, types of um, challenges that we see in Asia. And then one last thing I'd add, I mean, and, and I think it's, it's, it's excellent that like in Nigeria, like there, there is um, land holding by the farmers. What we're finding in some of the markets we're looking at is the smallholder farmers um, don't have title over their land. And that, that also is a barrier to them lending because typically financiers like to have some kind of hard collateral. Um, and so if they can't even um, borrow against their land, um, then that is like an additional challenge. So um, those are some additional areas that we're seeing um, coming from Asia. That's brilliant. We're getting a good overview, I think, of the agrofinancing and um, the issues in the in the industry across across geographies. Um, well, Ajit, do you want to add something to the sort of prognosis of the city of the sort of diagnosis of the situation? Or do you want to jump into you know, how blockchain and, and blockchain related technologies like DeFi can can help address some of these issues? Yes, I, I think I will jump right in because Ernest and Joanna has kind of expressed the situation in a very, very nice way. And I'll, and I'll pick from some of the words they said. Ernest spoke about the SDGs with reference to the hunger problem and the poverty problem. And Joanna, interestingly enough, spoke about the issues in agriculture that if we solve it, we can solve the hunger and poverty problem. And I like what you said, Joanna, about the intermediary layer, the question of pooling risk, and the question of portfolios. And those three areas is really where blockchains play a very, very big, big role. When we were co-creating this program, 
and I use the word co-creating very carefully with USAID and co and other partners, such as some commercial banks that joined the program, like First City Monument Bank in Nigeria, you know, the credit guarantee agency and many more. The question we needed to solve was that when you take a look at a smallholder farmer by himself, he is not viable for any form of financing. So question is, how do you now make that smallholder farmer viable? And the things you needed to solve were, one, the question of identity. Is this person who they say they are? The question of business profiling. Is the guy farming one hectare, two hectare? And then the question of return on investment. What yield do we expect? Immediately, you can do those three things. You can actually use the power of blockchain to create that farmer as a digital token, as an NFT, to create now a small, I call it nano pitch for that farmer. You know, in FinTech, you always hear about pitches for FinTech fundraising, pre-seed round, seed round, series A. <laughs> but agriculture is filled with millions of entrepreneurs, but nobody in the world sees them that way. And in actual fact, you can use blockchain now to create portfolios of these farmers for their own seed rounds, you know, and it now becomes super, super interesting. So, so we see um, blockchain as an infrastructure and beyond cryptocurrency solving that particular problem of identity, of portfolio management, of aggregation together. Because if I'm an investor, investment firm, structured firm, let's say in New York, and I want to deploy $10 million. There's no way I'm going to fragment my $10 million into $800. But if I saw a portfolio of $1, $1 million each with different risk profiles, then they become investable. And I don't worry too much about the underlying layer. The intermediaries solve that problem. And, and, and I'll talk a bit more about intermediaries. Uh, Basically, I mean, when I listen to Johanna and from the co-creation exercise that we are taking live very soon, to, to make blockchain fulfill its promise of solving these problems, you need all kinds of intermediaries. You need what I call the farmer aggregation intermediaries. That's the guy that puts a lot of farmers together. When you finish that now, you need the monitoring intermediary. That's the person in blockchain world we'll call a validator node or an oracle. The person that says this portfolio, you can trust it. It is what it is. If you, if you get that kind of intermediary, we begin to succeed. And, and fortunately, in the experiment we are running in Nigeria, we have such intermediaries. One of them is a company known as Crop IT, very interesting, interesting company. And then if you solve that layer now, you cannot solve the other layer, which is how do you now present this as portfolios, large ones, small ones, nano ones, the different categories of investors and get them to, to kind of invest. And I feel that when, if we're able to solve this, we'll make now agriculture a functional market. I always say, when you take a look at other markets, the market for aeroplane tickets, it works. When you take a look at the market for mortgages, it works. When you take a look at the market for automobiles, cars, it works. When you take a look at the market, market for clothing, it works. When you even take a look at the market for music, it works. So why is agricultural market not working? When in places like Nigeria, this is the $150 billion segment. How come it's not digital? How come it's not having an effect of $1 trillion? How come it's not a job engine? And you, you realize that it's really a combination of um, the architecture of the marketplace, the kind of infrastructure that supports it. So that's what I would say I can so that I don't dominate the conversation. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, we're, we're getting a good sort of a topography of the, the, the specific issues and some of the ways to answer them, but let's, um, can we perhaps uh, dive more into the specific issues and now more precisely uh, how blockchain can solve those specific issues? So from the conversation until now, we talked about uh, the need for investment and inefficiencies in fundraising. We talked about the transparency of those uh, of the use of funds. Um, we talked about supply chain issues and risk-related issues uh, like insurance, uh, lack of banking, like the interlinkage between the different parts that need to come together. So uh, off-takers, insurance providers, uh, banking partners, and these intermediaries. Um, 
Does anybody want to pick any one of those specific topics that um, um, that are interesting here? Ernest, is there one that seems to you more, anyone actually that seems to you like um, something different is happening thanks to uh, blockchain technology? Oh, yes. Um, I will want to look at the risk aspect and uh, how this te technology is addressing it. Yeah, because the thinking is that uh, if you want to really invest in commercial enterprise, you have the form formal financial sector to approach. And in a country like Nigeria, we have a very lively uh, you know, commercial financial market. However, the issue of risk and the way it is perceived, and to some extent, the, um, the way the economy had grown from a trade uh, market to from trade to service sector without considering uh, real sector development, creating the fundamentals, it has kind of uh, disoriented the, the money market, quite frankly. And so the, each time you want to redirect attention, the first thing you hear is risk. And in the financial system, the way you manage risk sometimes, it's not so much about the comforts you lay here and there as it is about the structure of a transaction. And so if you design a financing product in a way that the structure in itself mitigates risk, if you really want to support that enterprise, you can do so safely. And so the, the commercial market in this space has not been very, very creative in structuring transactions in a way that it will be safe. So we don't continue to sing about those limitations and uh, shortcomings of the smallholder farmers. Since we know that these people are critical to our economic system. So the blockchain system here now as uh, being presented under AgriFi comes with a structure that takes care of risk. What does the farmer really need? Does he need to touch cash? He doesn't. So you are not at uh, the mercy of a farmer as to what he will do with cash in the event that you disburse cash to him. What the farmer needs is inputs, services. Now, like Balaji has said, how much do we know about this farmer? And in this day and age where we have um, uh, the internet, is it possible to geolocate this farmer and his assets in such a way that at any point in time, you know what is going on um, on the declared asset production base of that enterprise, of that farmer? That is possible. So reducing the number of foot soldiers that have to actually be at the in neck of this entity so as to make sure that uh, you're not at the mercy of that entity. So we have that system here where farmers are properly identified, their assets are geotagged, and these are documented. Now, what about administering the inputs? We have an extension service provider that has track record that will not only show pharma the best way to apply the bundle of inputs to achieve a certain yield benchmark. And if you achieve that yield benchmark, your return on investment is assured and your capacity to service any obligation associated with that enterprise is also assured. So we have such entity in place. And then what about the, the market? Yes, because you could do all the production and there's no structured uptake, no um, uh, you know, organized way of getting uh, commensurate value for produce because the market is in this array, the value chain is not fixed. Now we have in this arrangement, committed industrial end users and operators in the food uh, industry and processing industry who require the produce of this uh, entity and who require assurance of their supply chain to make sure they utilize their industrial installed capacity efficiently. Now, we also have partners who play a specific role according to their normal cost of business. Insurance, 
Yes, because plan and structure everything as you can. Random events can happen. And in these days of intensified climate risk um, uh, circumstances, insurance becomes very critical. So is there an entity like that? That entity comes in and plays its role as it should using appropriately structured insurance underwriting products. So with all of this aligned, you could see that the transaction structure that puts capital at the hands of a farmer to enable him go to farm and do what he's supposed to do and generate the produce that would reward his, his ent enterprise and of course uh, deliver a return to whoever is investing in that smallholder farmer. All of these are taken care of in this structure. So where is the risk? That's the question. And of course, to make it, to bring it closer to the uh, you know conventional um, money market situation as possible, there's also a layer of credit risk guarantee. So the risks are taken care of by way of a structure of this um, this uh, value stream, such that one can see how fund comes in, and one can also see how funds come out. So there is cash flow assurance. And like Balaji was saying, it is this cash flow assurance that guarantees success in all the enterprises he mentioned, aviation, telecoms, um, uh, trade, whatever it is. It is that cash flow assurance as a result of a structured relationship in the value stream and the market that assures that those enterprises are working. And that's what has not happened in agricultural financing. Uh, we, we keep talking about smallholder farmers. We know how vital they are, but nobody has taken that pain to structure them in this way so as to see end-to-end -end the cash flow assurance that ensures that whatever goes into uh, that enterprise comes out safely. So this is where AgriFi makes the difference. And so when the USAID's project, the Feed the Future uh, project, in promoting um, business solutions that will enable farmers have access to inputs and services. And we came across this initiative. It, 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 it flashed as a model that is worth projecting beyond Nigeria and indeed um, globally to solve the problem of the smallholder farmers. Because uh, to a large extent, we find that their situation uh, is like the same in most areas around the world. Um, what, what, thank you very much, Ernest. I think what would be very helpful uh, is to get into a little bit more of the details of how projects work. Um, Jonah, would you like to tell us a bit more about um, how how the setup works on our, on your side and what are so then we can you know also talk about AgriFi and put these together and see if there's some similarities and differences in in the way they operate. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was going to say, I think there are a few layers to this. Um, first, I, I want to be clear that um, at least from where, where, where we sit, like uh, blockchain does not solve all the problems with smallholder farmer financing. I think um, there's still a lot of problems, but, uh, but partly because we don't really live in a world yet where everything is on blockchain, right? If we lived in a world where everything was on blockchain or everything was programmable money, um, then yes, you know, you you could really have that end game that um, I think the original crypto native DeFi has painted that picture for us, right? Because if anyone has Ethereum anywhere in the world, we don't need to know each other. I can put five Ethereum in a smart contract um, the contract um, sets up all the terms and people who don't know me can pledge to it and they know with 100% enforceability that, that they're gonna be able to get that back. Um, what we lack in the current state of affairs, um, which is why we have to start working with these intermediaries and I'll go a little bit into how we do it, but then th there are obviously still limitations, right? Um, uh, is that not all money is, on 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 chain, right? So um, if we were in that situation, you could have a farmer in Sulawesi say, you know, I want to borrow $1,000 for like a three month harvest and they could borrow it, be very, very clear about the terms under which they would repay it. And you could control all of those things and make sure they don't like sell it anywhere else. Um, and you would have that kind of enforceability. Uh, I think right now that's still an area that is um, not fully there. So how we've 
dealt with it is um, for us, we don't, um, uh, I, I think we're uh, Torna and USAID, I think with like this very exciting project that you guys have put together um, and, uh, you know, you guys have put more of the pieces together. Um, what we do at Aruka is a little bit more focused on the capital market side in the sense that um, what we found in Indonesia and India is that there are a lot of um, what I call like kind of digital cooperatives, right? So we all know traditional cooperatives, um, you know, they're groups of smallholder farmers. A lot of times they do organize the farmers in terms of figuring out the projects and then like um, arranging the sale to, to corporates. Um, what has happened interestingly post uh, that digital transition in India and then also post the pandemic uh, in Indonesia especially, um, is there have been a lot of digital co-ops that have emerged and, and those solve three key issues actually for their traditionally like a uh, smallholder farmer space, which is inputs are too expensive and the price on sale is not very good. And then they don't get a lot of technical assistance to transition to sustainable practices to like, you know, best in class um, ways of improving their yields and um, related things. Um, and then relatedly also they don't have access to credit. So where we come in is we partner with the platforms that are already sort of going out and um, building these digital footprints, but they are the ones who, in the context we are working in, um, they're the ones who are getting the off takers. They're the ones who are procuring the inputs. They're the ones who are putting the project plan together. They're the ones providing the technical assistance. And what we do is we partner with some of these largest guys who are now saying, okay, we want to do more embedded financing to the smallholders in our supply chain um, that we have organized in this digital form and established a digital footprint for. Um, and then we partner with them to use those digital footprints. Plus, um, you know, we partner with them to make sure that they're validating like uses of funds um, so that there's some traceability. Um, and then we bridge that into capital markets. The other piece we do, and are experimenting with as well is to bring down the cost of credit. I mean, um, you know, I think we we are living in an environment right now where the cost of credit has gone up significantly in the last year plus, right? Um, so in a, in a setting where mid market, small, or more really medium sized businesses in America are paying twelve percent per annum in USD on credit, then it gets trickier, right? Getting like affordable credit to smallholder farmers who, at least for a global financier who is not on the ground, who doesn't see the power of some of these ecosystems that are being built up, um, it's hard for them to get their heads around like why there's no risk premium to the smallholder farmers um, in emerging markets. So um, what we try to do uh, also with these digital supply chains then is to work with them on, on pulling out um, environmental and sustainability uh, you know, environmental and social, so ES, more ENS of the ESG, um, uh, relevant uh, factors and, and data um, as much as possible at the farmer level, and, and if not possible at the ecosystem level, um, to then provide that to um, global financiers who care about that and are willing to provide lower cost of credit uh, for that. So, um, so how we work is very classic embedded financing. We, we find these digital co-ops or ecosystems that have very much digitalized and we partner with them on embedded financing into those farmers. So it's a slightly different approach. Um, I think the other thing we're finding, and, and it could be very different in Nigeria, um, is that a lot of the target segment we're dealing with is still actually not even online. Right. So a lot of them are very, very rural, far out places uh, that don't actually have that great Internet coverage, even if the overall country they're in has gone quite far on digitalization. But that digitalization is still very, very concentrated in large cities. Um, and the actual Internet coverage drops off significantly once you get like a bit further out from the city. So, um, again, like these um intermediary digital co-ops that we work with then become a huge part of that bridge in terms of they look like they'll set up you know like a like a village hut um where where they work with the farmers um, and start building those digital records with them so the other piece we are also trying to build in 
um, but this is a work in progress, is uh, partnering with on the ground NGOs um, that operate in those spaces who can partner with us on some kind of technical assistance or like ENS, like data validation um, for, for segments that they are, are concerned with. Um, and so, uh, so that, that's the way we do it. Uh, very uh, you know, embedded financing with ESG. And but we but we partner a lot with these digital co-ops. Um, our our thesis is sort of you know at least in the markets in which we operate, um, I think we're about probably like three to five years out from um, like farmers you know being fully ready to use like mobile phones and then maybe even like crypto wallets. Um, I think different markets have different levels of readiness, um, but that's what we found in the markets we're working with, which is why we take this approach. Um, but we've built our blockchain-based infrastructure in a way where an application layer, we're EVM compatible. Um, and so we've built it in a way that's modular enough that when uh, the behavior is ready and the internet infrastructure is ready, or even just like, you know, we're starting with like mobile phones and there's the ability to then extend what we're offering into farmer level wallets. But at this point, uh, we, 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 you know, we start where we are, uh, where we can solve the problem. So that's what we have focused on. Uh, and, and, and that's the exact model we're taking for all the platforms we're partnering with. Um, so we're not as much doing the like building of the ecosystem, if that makes any sense. Um, that's very interesting. If I just correct me for my own understanding, it feels to me from what you're saying that your, and we'll get into AgriFi later for the viewers to, to make it more clear, but it seems that you're operating on maybe a higher level of aggregation, like the digital cooperatives that you talk about could be AgriFi pools or AgriFi itself. They could, yes. Exactly. You're on a one, one step yeah. higher. And you're more yeah. connected to the capital markets in the link. Oh, yes, exactly. And yeah. this is actually, thank you for picking that out. And um, I, I think I, I alluded to it like briefly earlier, but I, and and what I'm finding actually in, in just general conversations with the market is that um, a lot of people actually don't realize like how much like like you need both, right? Um, and 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 yes, we want to move away from unnecessary intermediaries, but there's a certain type of intermediation um, that is needed uh, because there isn't very good infrastructure, um, especially around like credit data and um, just access to the internet um, for this target segment. So uh, yes, our what what we are focused on at Aruka is really building that capital market layer that would partner whether it's with AgriFi or with um, just like supply chain platforms that have become digital. Um, and then and then we bridge them um, in a fairly targeted way into global capital markets. Great, great. Um, well, Edgy, now I think it's a good time to for you to explain basically how AgriFi works and how it addresses some of the, the problems that we talked about. And, 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 and Joanna has put out some really powerful keywords there. I think you can pick up on all the way from, you know, wallets to connectivity to cryptocurrency to there's many things I think you can, you can relate to. Um, yeah, great. Great. So let me speak a bit about how Agrify um, works. But I'll start from what I call what is foundational. And I'll quote the great Peruvian economist, Anando de Soto who wrote a book, The Mystery of Capital. And he was trying to get people in the global South to understand that creating wealth in the global South can look mysterious, but it is not. And he was trying to say that in the global North, people have kind of forgotten what it took them and the structures they put in place to create capital or wealth for everyone. So my first point is, there is a social trust that makes societies and economic, economies and ecosystems work. Those, that social trust expresses itself in codes of conduct and in laws. When people like Satoshi and Vitalik came up with the idea of blocking a smart contract, the spirit of the idea was that the social trust that is invisible can we write it into code so that economies, markets, and interactions can work without us depending on somebody to behave in a certain way? 
So that's my first um, foundation. Let's call it the philosophical bit. The second bit of my foundation is to understand AgriFi, you have to understand TradFi, traditional Fi, and DeFi. And then realize that what we call AgriFi today is actually hybrid Fi. It has taken the best of both worlds to achieve its outcome. And what problem, which is my third point, is AgriFi solving? And Hannes has alluded to it very well. It's really democratizing access to markets, especially capital markets, for those that would never have dreamt of being able to access that capital. And it's doing it by not putting the technology in front of the farmer, but the people and the solution in front. Because when I'm a farmer in a rural village in Nigeria, what's my problem today? Farming season starts in four weeks. I have no clue whether I will have enough money to plant my two to three hectares of land. I have no clue whether the input will even arrive when I want it. And I have no clue whether I will sell it. So what AgriFi does is want to give the farmer the assurance that you can access the capital that you want, there's already a buyer waiting for you and input suppliers are available to deliver them to you. And for the farmer, it's a very simple construct. Because of partners like USAID Feed the Future and many more who have done a lot of work on the ground in terms of extension. They've done what I call the hardest work, which is let's call it um, physical profiling so that we can know where the farmer is, who he is, what are his social relationships and who is the extension person serving him on ground. Immediately that work is done, AgriFi takes that pool of data and brings them on chain. At this point in time, the farmer has not even done anything. Then the extension partner is the one that is interacting with the farmer. And fortunately, we're in a part of the world where the farmer may not have a smartphone, but they have a future phone. And there's a very popular service channel in this part of the world called USSD, Unstructured Supplementary Service Data, which is like browsing in a very simple way, like SMS browsing. That's the, in, in the early days of the mobile networks, there was SMS chats. What we used to call SMS chats in 2005-7 is what they call USSD today to, to, for, the, for the audience. And because many of the farmers are able to do that, it means they can interact with a digital wallet. And the farmer is not exactly interested in what is inside that wallet whether it is a token, it is what have you, the farmer needs that wallet as one, a store of value, as its connection to actual bank accounts and agent network in the real world, and the means of keeping record and track of what is going on with respect to him. So Ag AgriFi does that for the farmer. And then that wallet is the touch point for all other actors in the ecosystem, from the guy that will supply inputs, from the guy that will provide extension, from the off-taker that will settle his loan. It's that wallet that is at the center of everything. And everybody is interacting with the farmer, with each other, from the perspective of social trust, which is we're in an ecosystem, like Anna said earlier, that is highly de-risked. And accountability is very clear. And that's why the question of um, the validator node that company I mentioned earlier, called Crop IT, that they come into play, that serves as the equivalent of Oracle in a pure Web 3.0 world. And I agree with um, Joanna. And, and this is where I feel that in Web 3.0, there's more than 600 to 700 years history of financial systems in the world today. We can't just throw away everything. We have to kind of take the best of the new knowledge which is the power of Web 3.0 to allow people from anywhere in the world to interact together in a trustless way, in a way that there are smart contracts that enforce the rules of the game. And then to plug in actors in the real world who we'll make sure that those interactions, they are what we say they are. You know, and, and that's what, I mean, AgriFi really is, and I hope I've kind of described it in as simple as a way as, as possible. So if you're a farmer, and let's say you are somebody in, let's say, North Carolina, and you've got 500 bucks that you would like to invest in a nano investment in Africa. AgriFi is your bridge to that nano investment, conceptually. And if you are a structured investor and you've got a million dollars, 
Agrifa aggregates all those nanos to become no longer nanos, but they become not even micros. They become now megas, portfolios. I mean, I mean that's how I describe it. Thank you, Akan. See, in your last, uh, in your last uh, sentences, you answered the question I was going to say, because yes, you described the farmer side of AgriFi. You hadn't really described what it means for investors and people looking to, uh, to, to finance uh, farmers. And maybe trying to put together like a lot of the concept that I picked up through the, the things that all three of you said um, concerning AgriFi. The one thing that's very interesting to me is that, as you said, Wulaji, it's a, it's a it's a intertwining of traditional finance and decentralized finance through this uh, platform of intermediaries. So it's an ecosystem around built around farmers and the people who enable their financing. So those people are weather insurance providers. Those people are credit guarantee institutions. Those people are extension service providers, um, food aggregators, um, traditional banks, yeah. where some money does need to flow in and out, mm -hmm. input providers. So people who sell seeds, fertilizers, uh, mechanical uh, goods, machinery. Um, so these are all the people that are brought together in order to facilitate one simple thing, which is to connect an investor and an investee that don't know each other and that cannot trust each other. And at the same time, now, if you just step back and look from a blockchain and, and purely de de decentralized finance perspective, like, like Joanna was saying before, you'd say, but wait a minute, there's a ton of intermediaries here. Like, how is this decentralized? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't want, like, the point is to have no intermediaries. But I think that's, as, as Joanna said, like, everything is not on chain today. That's something that you have to remember. So when you're connecting, and this is why decentralized finance has been having a lot of problem creating sustainable yield that comes from actual economic activities because on chain is something the economy is somewhere else and bridging those two you do need a set of intermediaries the question is can you have not one intermediary not one person not one company that you have to trust but a diffuse system that is basically um, distributed and as such you know in the range of of, of decentralization and, and in time, like Joanna was saying, you can get to more and more automation as the kind of things that we're doing with, with AgriFi. I'll just use one feature that I found really cool is that farmers in AgriFi, they have a, they have a wallet, so a blockchain wallet that's based on, on the Tornet blockchain. And they have a matching bank account, but they don't need to go to the bank to open that account. It's because we have a, we have banking partners, and since they connect with credit guarantee um, institutions, they need to, to to have bank accounts, so they can just match it through the KYC system that we already have thanks to other partners. So you see, I think this is the really interesting part: is like when you start to put together a lot of actors in an ecosystem, and then you can trade create trust, scalability, and you can preserve both revenue for farmers. AgriFi is projecting something between 85 to 90% revenue retention for farmers, and at the same time offer very interesting yield that then becomes ag um, that you can aggregate, like Joanna was saying before, again, because you know um, investors need uh, diversification. Um, so this is, I think, the beauty and the sort of alchemy that you can create putting all these, all these people together. I'll quickly uh, take a look at the chat. I see there is already three questions, maybe you can start taking some questions. Um, okay, we have somebody who is asking for a partnership. That's uh, maybe not the best place to talk about that, but feel free to just reach out to the panelists. Um, I think everybody uh, is on LinkedIn here. So depending on who you are aiming for, Inifix, please just, uh, just contact us. Um, we have somebody who's saying, for the farmer, what is the advantage of e-wallet slash tokenized approach versus classic online payment system? 
I think that's a really good question. Who, who wants to take that one? What is the advantage of using a, an e-wallet and a tokenization process instead of just a, you know, a payment system like PayPal, for example, or any, anything else? I mean, I mean, Joanna already answered that. Majority of farmers are not on PayPal. They are somewhere else. Yeah. And the, yeah, I mean, the infrastructure uh, where the farmers really are, these people who want to impact where they are, the access to basic banking infrastructure is another challenge. But this is one advantage of this approach um, of uh, decentralized finance using uh, the wallet system, the USSD as described by Bolaji. That way you cut out all those brick and mortar challenges that are holding the farmers away from the formal financial system. Um, oh, oh, so Joanna, Joanna was in. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, I mean, the, the guys we're working with uh, are not, um, I, I think we're, we're, we, we aren't giving them a wallet. So it's a bit different because we're more focused on the capital markets layer. I mean, at the one thing that I might add in this in this question here is that they are the, the the limitations of the traditional payment systems are the inability to bring together all those partners that I mentioned before and to create an ecosystem. Right? You can just send money and transact and transfer, but you can't say like you can't bring in together people who have different functions. So an insur insurance provider who needs to put a collateral or a food aggregator who will pay a future um, agreement on the, on the price, so who, who would put down collateral as well for a loan. So that's the really big difference. That's the, the programmability of money and the creation of the ecosystem. I think that's one very big, big difference on top of what others said. Um, so if we could also emphasize that actually those other players, uh, because of their, um, the, the their position in the um, you know, economic system, they are able to integrate, to in interact with the formal financial system. So uh, they, uh, of course you have a formal financial sector partner that's also warehousing, uh, that serves as a host um, to the payments and the settlements. So like it was described, there is, uh, this, this is a hybrid which involves the real life of formal financial structures and this uh, interface that enables the um, smallholder farmers who are kind of financially excluded to eventually come on board and get progressively integrated into the financial system. Of course, that's the end game. It is not to let them remain where they are. As they participate in this and have access to capital, increase their economic um, um, activities and their outputs, they progressively create wealth at that level. And of course, they feed into the formal financial system and begin to take advantage of all those structures um, progressively. Um, so there's another question here. This is also a very interesting one, I think. It's, it's specific to Nigeria, but I think it, 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 it links to other markets. Uh, someone is saying, considering the Nigerian central bank uh, CBN policy on cryptocurrency, is there a, is there a way uh, you hope to bring funding to a Nigerian smallholder farmer? So first yeah, of all, that, that can, go ahead, Abayaji, please. Yeah, that, that I can respond to, because it's kind of important to understand what did CBN ban? CBN did not ban blockchain as an infrastructure. And that's why even the Nigerian government itself approved a national blockchain policy. I wish spirit is to say, look, you can use tokenization and its power to perform the economy. What the Nigerian government banned was crypto speculation. Assuming we said we wanted to not create an aggrified, aggrified um, cryptocurrency that people will be trading in the market, we will be really running afoul of the law. But the, to use the technology to solve real problems for people, Nigerian government didn't ban, ban that. So that's a, that's, it's, it's a kind of materially very different construct. So Agrifa is not about cryptocurrency trading. 
it's about using blockchain as a fundamental infrastructure or using the word the there was a phrase you came up with a few days ago um regarding um technology i think it is is this society changing technology i'm trying to remember the phrase i can't ah, general you know, purpose technology general purpose technology exactly the use of blockchain as a general purpose technology is not banned by nigerian government so 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 i think that's the what i will add i don't know whether you have anything to add i can or anybody else I mean, it's very similar in Asia, like we are not um, having farmers take loans in Bitcoin or Ethereum, they're taking loans in hard currency. And we use blockchain as an infrastructure for transparency and programmability. Um, so very, very similar to Tornet. Uh, and, and I think that that's really where I think we're all focused. That's, yeah, beautiful summary. I think that's also some of the limitations of the connection between uh, DeFi and the real world. Um, yeah, there's, it's just not about cryptocurrency. Um, one more question here we have, how does AgriFi hope to bridge the technology gap? So I'm not sure exactly which technology gap do you, are you referring to? Because, I mean, there are several. several. Um, does Ernest or Bolaji want to address this one? I mean, the way I would think about it is really, because there are many ways to think about it. And I'll draw on our experience when we started the wallet program 10 years ago. So that was a very interesting experience. When we said, we're going to deliver credits, financial credits to farmers' mobile wallets. And as, at that point in time, if you registered 100 farmers, only 35, this was 2011, had phones. So the very first year, 2011 into 2012, we could only achieve like 30% participation. But the minute farmers understood that, okay, my phone does more than calls, the participation rates jumped from 35% to about 52% for 2013, 2014. By the time we're arriving at 2016, more like five, six years later, you had a situation where as if you registered 100 farmers, you could be sure that 80 of them had at least a basic future phone. So I, I look at technology in the rural areas as a continuum. I look at it as technology for communication and accessibility, I can be reached. You know, then there's technology for, for higher productivity. You know, the two are related, but not necessarily the same. So today, what we see is that technology for higher productivity, high yield seeds, high quality fertilizer, organic fertilizer, that technology and its knowledge is gradually reaching more and more farmers. And the technology for communication is what I call a lagging indicator. Because as farmers get more yield, they get more money. And then what is the first thing they do? They send their children to school. They try to upgrade their communications infrastructure so that now they move from basic phones to low-cost future phones that, that some manufacturers. Then if they earn more income, they move slowly, slowly, slowly. So like in America, it might take somebody in this part of the world 10 years to reach an iPhone, you know, but in three years, they will move from a basic phone to a low-end smartphone. Like the new ones coming out of Nokia these days that are running Kairos OS, that you can do basic WhatsApp and things like that. I don't know whether there are a lot of them in Asia, Yuana, but in this part of the world, there are those small phones that you can do basic yeah. social media on them. There, there is a lot of that in Asia. I mean, what we are finding, though, and the reason, and maybe this addresses the uh, anonymous attendees question, because um, they've clarified that it was technology gap in terms of access to tech devices. I think um, access to tech devices is one. I think, as Balaji correctly pointed out, I think there are a lot of low-cost tech devices that are available. I think the other thing, obviously, you have to worry about is a lot of these farmers are in areas without internet coverage, right? So even if they have um, a device, um, they're not gonna be able to um, have reliable enough access um, to the internet for, for it to be a reliable. And then there are actually, so if I, I address a couple of those things first, um, in terms of where we are in Asia and, and the partners we're working with, um, we at Aruka, again, because we're the layer focusing more on the uh, connection to the capital markets. And one thing I didn't, 
dive too much into is um, another part of how we are using blockchain is actually to enable bottom-up blended financing at scale. Um, and I'll just throw that in as a little teaser um, for maybe another conversation. Um, but you know, as, as you guys might be familiar with, some of you might be a lot of times how we unlock um, affordable credit to um, newer markets to markets like this, where I think what we're doing here, I, I think all of us are trying to figure out is how do you establish to the market the appropriate pricing for the risk reward that is now available through AgriFi and through these social ecosystems. And I think um, that's that's a that's something that all of us are aiming to work towards. And one of the pieces that usually gets us there is often um, blended financing structures where someone who cares about the impact or development outcome um, takes you know some some junior or or like a risk piece um, that uh, that is tied to some kind of um, sustainability or ESG related outcome um, and 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 you can operationalize that at scale. So so those structures have typically only really been done for you know, $50 million transactions and up. And, and now with blockchain, you can actually do it for as small as $5,000 um, at a farmer level kind of data. So that's one part actually that's quite powerful. Um, to the point uh, of how you reach out to the last mile in terms of tech devices and and all that, um, Balaji and 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 everyone else in the panel talk a little bit more about how they're doing it with Tornet. Um, but for us, um, we, we're focused on the ecosystems. The ecosystems that we're working with are, the ones who basically go into the villages and they work with the with the um, often off grid farmers, um, but I will say, say that the technology in general is at a level at which you can start a deal, dealing with some of those things because, um, for instance, our blockchain engineers on our team um, have actually previously worked on a blockchain based wallet um, that is compatible with. Uh, non-internet connected areas. Um, and so what they do is device to device transfer, like a check space system. Um, and, and you can do device to device transfer until maybe like once a week you go to the internet cafe that's maybe like, you know, three hours away and, and you sync all the devices at one shot. Um, you know, th these types of technologies are already possible, they're available. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's actually a really, really exciting time to be building out this type of infrastructure. And, and if I may also compliment from our space here in Nigeria, uh, the fact is that um, we have met some considerable progress, really, with respect to the wallet system and uh, the commercial uh, financial, uh, financial market here is quite active and you have a lot of agency banking solutions that run on point of sales terminals and so in the rural communities at the, at the last mile, really. And in fact, um, the, the uh, former Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, who is currently the president of the AFDB, had actually challenged us at a certain, uh, with this issue of getting inputs and services across to the last mile. Uh, he provided, these are agricultural inputs. And he kept asking that question, if we can take Coca-Cola or yeah. um, the, 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 the uh, card, the recharge card, for a future phone, if we can take it to the cave in the village, why can we not create a structure by which we can take fertilizer, seed, um, uh, crop protection uh, preparations, and other such services to the last mile, to the village, uh, to that remote village? And people are doing these things with respect to uh, the call cards, the soft drinks, and such things. Um, entrepreneurs, micro, small and medium entrepreneurs are doing these things without relying on uh, the big infrastructure of the public sector. So if this is happening with respect to those things, why can it not happen in agriculture? That challenge, the minister, uh, uh, Dr. Kimumi Adeshina, did throw it and um, it, it, uh, it caught on and people responded to that, uh, that, that challenge. So we have uh, this distribution system that has been made possible by a very vibrant commercial uh, banking system. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of these agency banking solutions and points of sales terminals. And then this layer of um, private extension service providers themselves, they are uh, 
you know, the layer that is closest to that uh, isolated or that uh, dispersed smallholder farm, farm, farming community. Now, these entities themselves have access to internet and relying on them and their closeness to the smallholder farmer at the last mile and taking advantage of this point of sales terminals and these other uh, structures. The language of wallet system is not totally uh, foreign to the smallholder farmer, which is why what we're emphasizing at this time from the extension activity point of view is agricultural technology. Have we convinced, persuaded the farmers to shift from traditional practices to the use of improved uh, inputs and services that are not only um, you know, environmentally safe, but also ensure uh, guarantees um, uh, reasonable output to reward their enterprise. Have we succeeded in convincing the farmers that this is the way they go? And the answer is yes. So how do we um, finance this so that they can adopt what they have now come to accept? And using this, private extension service providers, an example of which was given, the crop IT uh, and the likes of that. We're able to, um, we, we are confident that uh, that issue of uh, internet and the limitations in terms of technology at the last mile, we can uh, bridge it so that the real objective of putting improved agricultural technology in the hands of smallholder farmers is achieved. And this is the excitement we also find in the AgriFi model that uh, mobilizing capital and walking through this pathway of, um, you know, the, the, the mobile payment systems that are on ground, the wallet systems and these extension service providers, we can make that connect safely such that capital can be deployed and safely recovered. Thank you very much, Ernest. I think we're getting close to the end. Um, uh, do you have any final words? No, from me, just to thank everyone on the panel and everybody that joined. Thank you so much for joining. I mean, this has really been awesome. Greetings all the way from Abuja, Nigeria. Um, yeah, likewise, thank you for organizing and thanks everyone who uh, joined. We're happy to connect. Um, again, our focus, uh, Aruka's focus is a little bit more institutional at this stage, but we're looking forward to building a community that um, cares about sustainability linked and affordable credit to smallholder farmers um, in emerging markets. We, we are starting in Asia and we're always happy to be in conversation with like-minded peers across the globe. Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Akan, for organizing this and for the audience and the participants. And um, the USAID Feed the Future Extension Activity is super excited about the opportunity of alternative finance. Yes, creating an alternative pathway to deploying capital safely where it is needed. We're excited about this opportunity and um, you can be sure that we'll give it all the support um, that it needs so that it becomes a model to be proud of that we can export to other parts of the world. That's our goal. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. I want to thank the three of you for your time um, and, and, and this um, really rich conversation. Um, thank you to the people who, who, who came to join the conversation. Um, maybe one thing that wasn't said clearly is that um, AgriFi is launching now. So in June, the first pools, uh, the first lending pools for uh, selected batch of farmers will be live. So. Uh, you can connect with us on different sites and socials that I that I posted if you want to follow all that. And yeah, thank you all the three of you. Uh, like Ernest, you just said we're actually you know together at whether it is at the capital market stage or at the very um, on the ground stage of connecting these actors. We're all together thinking about the future of finance, and uh, and it's it's really exciting to be here and talking with uh, with people like yourselves, working with people like yourselves. So yeah, thank you everyone and uh, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.